more sense. Let's say that some company advertises that that light bulb is going to last 20 years. Okay? What's the probability it's going to last 20 years? Pretty good, right? What's the probability it's going to last 21 years? Less. 20, now, could it last 100, 100 years? It could, right? Make sense? So these probabilities drop off. And then on this way, they drop off also. Now, this distribution forms a bell curve. Well, the sum of all probabilities has to be what? One, right? And so this integral would go from zero to infinity, right? And whatever that function is, we would need that area to be one for it to, be, for it to qualify as a probability distribution, probability density function. Make sense? That function right there is a probability density function. The area underneath that is one. And it forms what we call this, the normal bell curve. So this is the way they, there's certain theorems in statistics where they say if you have a large enough n, that means a large enough samples, pretty much everything is normally distributed. Almost everything looks like that. So if you look at like people's height, people's um, weight, if you look at uh, people's temperature, like you take their temperatures, like everything is normally distributed. Like what's the average temperature for a person? 98 points, whatever. They, they go back and forth on these things. 98 point what? Seven, six, whatever. Like we have this thing that we say is an average, right? And there's, there's some sort of like variance. Like, of course, you could have a temperature of 102, right? Could you have a temperature of 200? Yeah, maybe, maybe when the sun expands, right? When the sun expands and comes to get you. But the probability drops off. Look, you have to remember these probabilities are infinitesimal. Like they can be tiny. Like, like the probability of winning the lottery, is that pretty small? Oh, yeah. How about the probability of winning the lottery every day for the rest of your life? Could it happen? Yeah. Could happen. Probability, infinitesimal. <laughs> so that's what's happening here, infinitesimal. So I just wanted to give you some sort of idea, like some connection to the real world. We use these integrals from negative infinity to infinity, or even these from zero to infinity, something like that, um, to create these probability density functions. All right. 423. I think I have just enough time for this. Oh, by the way, that, that uh, function for the, uh, the standard bell curve there, if you tried to integrate it, you wouldn't be able to. It's one of those functions I told you can't be integrated. You have to have series to do it, which is chapter 8. So we, even if I asked you to integrate that, that, uh, that bell curve function, wouldn't be able to. It is 1, yes, but you wouldn't be able to show that on your own. You, you would need series to do it. It's just one of those functions you can't integrate. It really comes down to this. You, if you want to look at it in its most simple terms, that's it right there. And you can't integrate that. There's no technique we have for that. It's not, it's not even like, hey, yes, but if you take this other class, they'll show you a technique to do that. There's a bunch of functions we can't do. But that's where the series in Chapter 8 will allow us to, to handle it. This is really what differentiated... And that's not like a joke or anything. I'm just saying like, you know, differentiation in a calculus class. That's funny, no? That's what differentiates Isaac Newton from Leibniz. Because Isaac Newton had series. Leibniz, the other father of calculus, did not come up with series on his own. And so there were integrals that Leibniz would get that he couldn't do and Newton could do. So that's why I always look at Newton as being a little bit like more on top in terms of who was the father of calculus. Did that answer your question? I mean, we just can't do it. You, you can try. It's, no. it's a waste of your lifetime, actually. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Um, OK. Look at this right here. Show that the integral from 1 to infinity of 1 over p dx is divergent as long as p is less than or equal to 1 and convergent if p is greater than 1. So this is one of those math problems that's a lot different than anything I've ever really given you. 
These are, the, these are those problems that usually appear like towards the end of the section that are less mechanical that you actually have to think more about. Because we're being asked to show some, we're, we're asked to show some conclusion here, but about something that's generalized. See, they're not giving us a power here. P, they're not giving us that power. And they're just trying to get us to prove to ourselves that if that power P is less than or equal to one, then it's definitely gonna diverge. But if it's bigger than one, it's gonna converge. So I think the best approach for us is just to go ahead and set this up with the limit the way that we would had, had they actually given us a P. So I'm gonna let T go to infinity, integral one to T, and then one over x to the p dx, right? That's just the definition. When we see that, ne that infinity up there, we rewrite the limit, we replace the infinity with t, we let t go to infinity. What would be our next step? Integrate, Integrate that, right? So let me, let me help because sometimes you get like so far along you forget the most basic things. That's the same as this, right? That's like x to the n. How do we integrate x to the n? <coughs> 1 over n plus 1, x to the n plus 1. That's the power rule. Do you agree? So limit t goes to infinity. It'll be 1 over, what did you say? Negative p, Negative p plus 1 times x to the... Negative p plus 1. And we're going to evaluate that from 1 to t. All right, so that right there is your power rule for antiderivative of x to the n, but here n is negative p. Yes? Now, there is a problem with that. What if p is 1? If p is 1, you have a 0 down here, don't you? So that would not work if p is 1. Do you agree? So I need to come back here, and at the very beginning, I need to state that. For p not equal to 1, we have the following, don't we? We will address p being 1 in a little while. But are you clear as to why that's true? Because that formula falls apart if you let p be 1. All right, so for p not equal to 1, this integral becomes this, this, this. Now let's go ahead and uh, you know, use our brackets, two sets of parentheses, plug in t, plug in 1, take a limit, right? So limit, t goes to infinity, bracket, parenthesis, parenthesis, plugging in t first for what? x, x right? So. Uh, 1 over, man, I should have given myself a little more room. Let me give myself a little more room. Plugging in t. So 1 over negative p plus 1 t to the negative p plus 1. That's what I get when I plug in t, right? Minus, now plug in 1. So 1 over negative p plus 1, 1 times 1 to the negative p plus 1. I think we should try and resolve the second one first because this one does not have a t in it, right? So maybe we can just figure out what this is. What is 1 raised to any power? 1, right? 1 to any power is 1. So that's just a 1. 1 times that, that's, it's just that, right? Okay. So I have limit t goes to infinity. I've got parentheses, let's see, 1 over negative p plus 1, t to the negative p plus 1. Close that off. And then this was, this was a 1, right? Times that, I have a negative... With that negative, can I distribute that? Do you all mind if I just pass the negative down through the denominator? So that's just going to become minus, or no, plus now, right? Plus uh, 1 over p minus 1, because the negative will go here and through here. OK with that?
Now let's address this issue over here. The main problem that I have is Did that did that stack of papers get around to everyone? Where is it? Um, please sign in. The main problem we have right now is trying to figure out what the heck's happening to this. Do you agree? That's the only thing that is actually controlled by the T. <coughs> so let's, let's just look at that. Just that part, and we'll come back to this. So I need some room. Um, what would the limit, as T goes to infinity, of T to the negative P plus 1 be? So let t go to infinity, what happens? That's infinite, right? What's infinity raised to the negative p plus 1? It depends, doesn't it? Yeah, so what if, think of it this way. If this base right here is becoming infinite, what happens if I take infinity and raise it to a positive number? It's going to be infinity, isn't it? That's going to go to infinity. But what if I take infinity and raise it to a negative number? That's the same as 1 over positive x to the positive infinity, and that will go to 0, right? So really what matters here is what that power actually is. If this power is positive, it's going to go to infinity. If the power is negative, it's going to go to 0. So how do I write that? How do I state that? If, how about this? Do it this way. This equals one of two things. First, infinity, but that's going to happen when? When what's positive? Not P. When, when negative P plus 1 is positive? Agreed? When negative P plus 1, when this power is positive, we're going to get infinity. It's going to be 0 if the negative p plus 1 is negative, right? Now what I'd like for you to do is I'd like for you to take these two little inequalities and I'd like you to solve them for p. So solve this for p. Just add p to both sides. And wouldn't you, wouldn't you get 1 is bigger than p? 1 is bigger than p, which is the same as saying p is less than 1. And this one, if you move the p to the other side, you get 1 is less than p, which is the same as saying p is greater than 1. So if p is less than 1, this thing goes to infinity. And if that goes to infinity, this thing diverges, doesn't it? And then if p is greater than 1, this piece goes to 0, which kills that off and leaves you with this, doesn't it? Which, well, it depends on P, because P is not going to infinity. P is just some power. Can you just add to right? the question? I did answer the question, but I'm not done writing things down. I'm, I'm going to actually write, I'm going to continue from this right here, and I'm going to say this right here equals one of two things. So, but if P is less than 1, that always has to be a small positive. If P is less than 1... If p is greater than 1, then this has to be small. Well, what if p is 2? 2 minus 1, you just get 1. I mean, I don't know. Small is relative. I mean, I, I understand what you're saying, but. So would you write infinity? Yeah, how do we write this? Let's take care of this one first. What if p is less than 1? What happens? This diverges. Okay, that's what happens. So we could write infinity, but really at the end of the day, we want to say it diverges. And then if p is b bigger than 1, what happens? Converges. It converges, right? But to what? Converges to this, right? Because p 
P being greater than 1 kills this off, kills all that off, and all you're left with is this. So it converges to 1 over P minus 1. I wouldn't ask you problems like that, but if you're, like, if you're thinking of like minoring in math or like math is something you want to do, like, this is more like what a math person does. Um, now, there's something in red over in the corner. What if P is 1? We need, to, we need to actually talk about what happens. Well, why don't we do this? Why don't we just look at the integral? Why don't we just let P be 1? What would it be? 1 over x dx? Isn't that what it would be? Wasn't that the second example? Wasn't that the one you did when I walked out? Yeah. And what did you get? It diverges, right? So we can just make that equal. Even though our formula falls apart, we know what it does at 1. So I can just add it on to this. And we have concluded, right? We have done what we were supposed to do. We have shown that that integral is divergent if p is less than or equal to 1, and we have shown it's convergent if p is greater than 1. We've even gone above and beyond. We've actually shown what it converges to, right? So if you take the, the first example I gave you, what was the first example? It was 1 over x squared. What was p? 2, right? Okay, and according to this formula, we should get 1 over 2 minus 1. The answer should have been 1, was it? Yes, the answer was 1, right? If you plug in p is 2 here, 2 minus 1 is 1, 1 over 1 is 1, you get an answer of 1. That's what we got. So if this was uh, 1 over x cubed, then what would we have? 1 half. Make sense? Now, also, it, it, it has to start at 1. If it starts at 2 or something, then, then you, this formula wouldn't work. We, we could do it. We could tweak it, but that wouldn't uh, necessarily work the same way. All right, so we're pretty much out of time, but I do have a homework assignment for you because I know how much you enjoy homework. Nope. I have it right there. What's online? Is it? I don't think these were in. Oh, I typed those into the notes like earlier today. Oh, okay. Yeah. They're not in the online notes. Um, so this is the full assignment for 6-6 or 6.6. .6. What you can handle right now, if you're just going off of what we've covered in class, then you should only be focusing on 1 through 21 odds. Everything after 21 is the type 2 improper integrals. So you would kind of be like, what? All right, that's pretty much it, right? We're good. Have a good weekend. I think this weekend would be a good time to start.